remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again, and I hope you've been enjoying these series of programs we've done with liberal talk show host Mark Bland. Uh, parts one and two are, are already out, and part three will be coming out soon, probably in the next week or so, and that's the part where it all hits the fan, and uh, I actually have to throw him off the show and remove him from the building, so you won't want to miss that. It, it's just a show that I guess is proof that these days you simply cannot reason with liberals, and you cannot have a reasonable discussion with them, but... That's neither here nor there. That's the next show. What I actually wanted to talk about today was some of the controversy over the so-called gay marriage uh, idea that's up before the Supreme Court. And if you've been on social media at all over the last couple of days, your Facebooks, your Twitters, etc., no doubt you have seen your timeline absolutely blow up with people talking about the subject, and many of them probably in favor of so-called gay marriage or so-called marriage equality. Um, not just people that you know that always discuss politics and social media, but probably a lot of people that you may never have seen uh, post anything political in nature before. Maybe a lot of young people, that kind of thing. You may be shocked at how many people are talking about this and how many people appear to be supporting it. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit today. I didn't want to focus specifically on my personal opinion about so-called gay marriage, although that opinion will be very apparent to you as we go through this program. But what I wanted to focus on was the reasoning that some of these people who defend the idea are using to do so. Specifically, the misinterpretations and the misunderstandings and the misdefinitions that certain people have about various ideas with our Constitution or about various just basic definitions of words that they are misusing in their definition on this topic and in their support of this topic. And it strikes me to think that if they are misinterpreting and misunderstanding and don't really know what they're saying on this issue, then are such misinterpretations perhaps also influencing their opinions and their decision making on far more important issues than so-called gay marriage? These type of misinterpretations, are they influencing their opinions on important topics like taxation and illegal immigration? Perhaps they are. So maybe this discussion is a teachable moment in America as we eventually talk about far more important topics than so-called gay marriage. Now, one of the things I've been seeing a lot of uh, pro-gay -mar pro marriage uh, proponents talk about is the idea that the current marriage definition, one man, one woman, is somehow discriminatory in nature, or that there's somehow a lack of inequality that is inherent because of that definition. And of course, when you tell people that, that there's discrimination out there, that there's inequality out there, there's a lot of people that react very emotionally to that, and they don't think it through entirely. But I want you to think the definition of marriage through entirely in terms of discrimination or, or equality. Is there discrimination that exists because of this law, because of this rule? Well, when I think about it, really the answer is no. I mean, after all, the same law applies, the same definition applies, the same way to both gay and straight people. Yes, gay people are prohibited currently from marrying members of their same sex. So are straight people. Straight people can't do that either. Likewise, yes, straight people can marry members of the opposite sex. But gay people also can marry members of the opposite sex if they wish for whatever reason. So the law is being applied the same way to everybody. No group is being singled out. No group is being told, okay, this group has one set of rules and you have a different set of rules. That's not happening at all. Same rules, same definition apply to everybody. So there is no discrimination involved whatsoever. There is no inequality involved because the law is being applied equally across the board. I've even seen some people try to link this to the old civil rights movement of the 1960s and the Civil Rights Act. And well, we could probably have an entirely different discussion on the Civil Rights Movement and if the Civil Rights Act went too far. Personally, I think it did. Even in that case, it's ludicrous to try and link the so-called gay marriage argument to the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s. No gay person is being forced to drink at a different water fountain. No gay person is being, you know, prohibited from getting into a school or opening a business or going into certain businesses or eating at certain lunch counters. That's not happening. So I'm sorry, folks, the 1960s are dead. As far as that goes, there is no discrimination and no inequality inherent with the current definition of marriage. 
Another thing I've heard people say, another uh, idea I've heard people use to try and, and, and prop up and try and defend their support of so-called gay marriage is the idea of separation of church and state. There are people out there that claim that because they believe the definition of marriage is inherently a theological one, I would agree with that, because it's a theological definition, it therefore has no validity. It therefore cannot be used as a basis for law, that there is somehow a separation of church and state. However, this is absolutely untrue. There is no separation of church and state in America. Yes, you heard that right. There is no separation of church and state. Some of you have your jaws on the floor right now, particularly some of you who are younger and have just come through the educational system. Maybe you're in college now. You've probably been told all your lives that there is a separation of church and state. No such thing exists. Do yourself a favor. Go through the Constitution. Go through it with a fine-tooth comb and see if you can find the words separation of church and state anywhere in that document. You will not find it. It doesn't exist. What does exist in the Constitution is the Establishment Clause, which does prohibit the federal government from establishing a religion. Okay, so there can't be a first united church of the United States. Got it. And it prohibits the government from interfering with people uh, practicing their own religion. So, okay, good with that. But it does not say, it does not infer anywhere that legislation cannot be based on theological principles or that legislation cannot have things in common with widely accepted theological principles. That's not there. It doesn't exist. If it did exist, it wouldn't make any sense because if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, the entire basis for that document, and therefore the entire basis for our republic, is the idea that our federal government is there to facilitate the God-given rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The inalienable rights, if you will. And the Declaration of Independence specifically states and specifically acknowledges that those rights come from our Creator, that they come from God. So right there in the Declaration of Independence, our founding document, it is based on a theological idea. So it doesn't make sense that you couldn't use theological ideas in legislation. And furthermore, if that were the case, that theology were barred from legislation somehow, then that would mean we could not have laws against murder. We could not have laws against theft. We could not have laws against rape. Because practically any religion you want to name, any religion you want to find, practically, will tell you that murder is a negative thing. You should not engage in it. That theft is wrong. Rape is wrong. They all will, in their own way, say that. So because practically every religion in the world accepts that and says that, you couldn't have laws of that nature because they would be based in theological teaching. The entire reason we as human beings know that murder is wrong and that theft is wrong is because of our religious teachings. If it weren't for our religious teachings, we would not know that. We would go around murdering and stealing wherever we thought we could get away with it. And some people still do. So the idea that there's a separation of church and state absolutely asinine, absolutely doesn't exist. And people who are using that as a mechanism for defending so-called gay marriage are way off base. Now, let's bring this back to the big picture. What we've seen with this discussion of so-called gay marriage is something that I believe is part and parcel of the typical treadmill that you see a leftist uh, movement go down over time. You know, there's a lot of leftist movements out there like your civil rights movement, feminist movement, uh, so forth, that might have started out sounding kind of sensible. Might have started out sounding like, okay, this group of people is wronged and they want to be assimilated into society. And it's awful hard to, awful hard to dispute that. A lot of value in those things you know it's like back when you heard martin luther king jr say that a man should be a uh, judge on the content of his character rather than his skin color hell yeah i agree with that no problem there but what happens over time with a lot of these movements is that the left takes them from just assimilating into society to then trying to completely change society or to try and destroy society somehow and that's what i think is happening here you know the civil rights movement went from just hey, let's judge a guy in the content of his character instead of the color of his skin. It went from that to, okay, now we've got to give special educational advantages to certain minority groups. Or we've got to give them Head Start programs. We've got to give them affirmative action to get into college or to get into jobs. And it gave them an unfair advantage. It gave, 
came to a situation where they're trying to change society rather than assimilate into it. Likewise, in the feminist movement, it went from, hey, we want women to be able to get in the workplace and work. It went from that to, now we need women to change the workplace so men can no longer behave the way they always have. The workplace needs to be changed. The men are wrong. You see how easily that happens? It goes from assimilate to change and destroy. I think the same thing is happening with this so-called gay marriage movement. If you look back, and a lot of people don't realize this, back in the late 70s, early 80s, the gay community really didn't talk about gay marriage all that much. What they talked about were things like property rights and things like civil unions and things like being able to see uh, their partner in the hospital at a time of, of ill health, things like that. And I would tell you, and I would suspect, that if the gay community were continuing to go down that route today in 2013, they would have a massive amount of support behind that. There would be an awful lot of people from across the political aisle, including me, who would be well in favor of those things. But they didn't do that. They instead latched on to the word marriage. They instead tried to take a religious concept of marriage and force us to redefine it. A way of flipping the middle finger to establishment traditional values and to religious values, to force religion to change, to force our view of the world that has been shaped by religion to change. That's why there's so much pushback on this. You want civil unions? I'm good with that. You want the same property rights? I'm totally good with that. I may disagree with what you do, but it's your property. Your property rights are far more important than your civil rights. I'm all for that. But don't touch the word marriage. That's ours. You can't have that. What you do is not marriage. Now, there are those who would tell you that the current laws on so-called gay marriage are preventing people from loving one another. They're preventing gays from loving each other, preventing gays from being... That's not true at all. The current definition of marriage does not prevent gay people from living together or from loving each other, if that's the word you want to use. I prefer not to use that, but that's neither here nor there. Nothing of the sort is happening. Gay people can live together. Gay people can go behind closed doors and do whatever it is that they do. I might not agree with it, but hey, can sing and dance. I don't really give a shit, truthfully. But that's not good enough for some pe people in that community. They want the word marriage. They want us to be forced to change a religious definition. Not going to happen. It shouldn't happen. And I'll tell you why. There is no government in this world there is no court in this world, not the United States government, not even the Supreme Court of the United States, that has the authority to overrule God. It cannot happen. It is the height of human arrogance to think that we mere mortals, through our government, through our courts, can somehow change God's definition of anything. Some of you might be surprised to hear this. But I really don't care what gay people do, what they, how they want to live, what they want to practice, couldn't care less. But don't take our concept of marriage and try to twist the definition. It's not yours. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next time.